Let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're delighted to be together again this morning to place ourselves in front of you that you might teach us through your Holy Spirit about your Holy Word that you inspired the writers of the Scriptures to record for us so that we might know you. We might grow in our relationship with you. And we might be able to witness for you in the world. As we work on these last two chapters in the letter to the Romans, bring us into unity, Father. In Christ's name, Amen. So remember, Romans is all about this idea of God's salvation. How do we have salvation? How are we made righteous? And Paul is going to great lengths to try to explain that to the Roman church. And we know that um, as we begin chapter 15, <clears throat> once again, as we mentioned on Sunday, chapters and verses lots of times don't serve us well when we're studying the scriptures. Because clearly, the beginning of 15 is an extension of 14. Nothing new at all. So it's a, a summary. He's, there's a, a summarization and a conclusion that's made from the argument that he's been presenting in, in um, what we would call chapter 14. So let's review some of the conclusions here that are made from chapter 14. First of all, remember Paul was talking about how we each have convictions from the Holy Spirit. And those convictions sometimes don't line up with each other. Some people are convicted about this and other people are not convicted about that. So how, how do we measure that? And Paul is reminding us that convictions themselves are not sinful or not inherently sinful, but that a conviction can be sinful for some people. Right? Why is that? Well, because they can be convicted falsely. How do convictions work? Convictions work with our conscience, don't they? Conscience can make something sinful that God gives us freedom in. Hmm. So, we might be allowed to do something according to God's word, but in our heart and mind, we can't do that. What would be an example? Yeah. Playing cards on Sunday, maybe? Okay. Some people are convicted that that's, that's a sin. Uh, is that in God's Word? No, not really. So, so we have that issue there. Conscience can also, <clears throat> is unable to make something okay that God calls a sin. So while a conscience can convict us of something that God didn't say was a sin, on the other hand, it can't make something okay that God did call a sin. So our convictions are kind of tricky here sometimes. We have to know where is our conviction coming from. Paul makes this claim. The strong must bear with the weak. Because the weak are not strong enough to bear with the strong. <laughs> And that sounds like it's a talking in circles, but that's a really important point for us in the church as Christian brothers and sisters. Because there's a wide variety in the church. There's a, there's a big spectrum, not a variety. There's a big spectrum in the church of what kind of relationship we have with God, what kind of an understanding we all have. We have brand new Christians. Well, 
lots of times they don't understand hardly anything. And then we have people who have been living the Christian faith for decades. And, and so they have a much deeper understanding. Paul is saying that the burden is always on the strong to be patient with and bear up the weak. And then Paul says, do not violate your conscience. Our conscience is something that's unique to our human creation. We don't know that animal, animal life, animal kingdom has what we would call a conscience. So this must come from the image of God that we as humans are created with. It is an oughtness, a sense of oughtness in us of something that's right and something that's wrong, something I should do or something I should not do. It's a it's an inherent, intuitive conviction. <laughs> I don't know what the word to say. That, it, that, that God has given us. It's a way to connect us. And the Holy Spirit clearly uses that conscience, that, that conviction, that in our lives, that conscience in our lives, but it also can be perverted by the evil one. So you see, it's part of our spiritual reality. It's not necessarily part of our physical reality. So the evil one can put a false conscience or false guilt upon us. While the Holy Spirit is trying to and, and what, what's the difference between those two, All right? The difference between those two is when the Holy Spirit puts a false guilt, touches our conscience, makes us feel guilty falsely, that separates us from God. We talked about that on Sunday a little bit. You know, when we're not in a right relationship with someone, what do we do? We avoid them. So if... If the Holy, if, if the evil one rather, if the evil one can, can, can make us feel like as if, eh, there's, there's something wrong with God in us, then we're going to avoid God. That's the exact opposite of God wants. Every time the Holy Spirit uses our conscience, it's an attempt to bring us closer to God. All right. So that's that's the purpose of the Holy, Holy Spirit and our conscience and. We spoke to it on Sunday, and I'll, I'll mention it again. In my personal opinion, people wrestle with the scripture that talks about the only sin that cannot be forgiven. Right? There's only one sin that can't be forgiven. What is that? And it goes on to say it's a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, why would that be the only sin? What does that mean? that you can't forgive that sin. Well, and I think it comes to this point right here. One of the main purposes of the Holy Spirit is to convict us so that we would repent and confess of our sins and be drawn closer to God. On our own, we don't tend to do that. You know, because we can shut down our conscience. That's how people can do some pretty atrocious things. They, you know, with the power of the evil one, they kind of suppress their conscience and they, they go on. They, you can't totally eliminate it, but they, they override it significantly. So if we, if we are guilty of doing that, then we don't have any, we don't have any motivation. We are being pulled into confession and repentance of our sins. We're not being convicted of our sins, which would then cause us to repent and confess and be drawn closer to God. And if we can't do that, well, then God can't forgive. God will not forgive sins that are that we are not repentant for. And we know that. We deal with our own children that way, right? So, so it makes perfect sense to us. So, you know, you see how important this is. 
in the, in the scheme of things here as we are trying to work on forgiveness. That's one of the reasons I, again, personally, <clears throat> would, would point to the gospel in relationship to this issue that we're dealing with LBGTQ plus people today. Why? Because they want us, they are promoting, they are professing, they are, they are, they want us to believe that this is not a sin. And so they're not wanting to repent from that. And, you know, there's, there's the issue, in my personal opinion. That's, that's how these things all kind of fit together. So do not violate your conscience. When the Holy Spirit works with you and, and, and you know there's something wrong, you need to respond to that. Usually that means we need to confess and repent to somebody else lots of times and to God, both of those. And then that leads us to the concept of unity. Unity is what chapter 15 is all about here. And so that's where we're going to move into. Unity is a divine value. God, God extols unity among God's people. Especially, he brings it to our attention in relationship and using through Paul the metaphor, the example of a body. A body that's not in unity is what? We would call it spastic. And, and we know um, physically when the brain and the muscles of a body do not, are not unified, they're not in unity, then people have a very difficult time performing functions. They can't walk right, they, they can't move their, their body in right motions, sometimes they can't speak, they can't form words correctly. All right, so unity this concept of being unified, having everything working in unity, is an important issue. I would say that you could even make the case for the fact that our unity is, is as important and part of our holiness. To be unified is to be holy. To be disunified is to be unholy. That's kind of an interesting concept, too. You know, we might work on that some other time or have some discussion about that at some point. Unity of the body of Christ or the church is really important. God teaches us that, especially through Paul. Now, here's the issue that we're dealing with. In our physical reality, we know about the law of thermodynamics especially the second law of thermodynamics, which says that everything is working toward disunity and dysfunction. Energy is, com is de being depleted, and therefore things do not work the way they're supposed to work. That's, that's what we see in the world around us. So what we are called to do is to fight against that in the body of Christ so that we can maintain unity in the body of Christ. God is calling us to that. And remember, <clears throat> the, if we use a, a government analogy here, God is not the president of a democratic republic. That's not how God works. That's, that's, not, that's not how we exist. God is the king. God is the supreme ruler, albeit he's a benevolent ruler, which means he's the opposite of a dictator. Right? And what he has established for us is that we would live in this theocracy where God is king and God is supreme. We will never be equal to him, and so we are always subject to him. <clears throat> Now, in God's creation, you know, God made it clear to Peter and Paul that 
God did not create anything that was unclean. But God has, in history, assigned or made a decree that something would be treated as unclean to accomplish some of God's purposes. It's not unclean, but God decreed that it would be considered or treated as unclean. That was the whole issue with Peter, remember, with the sheep and the animals and said, eat anything you want. And Peter said, I can't eat that. That's unclean. He said, did I make it? That's not unclean. You know, so as citizens of the kingdom of God, here's the reality. We don't have any say. God's here. We're here. So we need to keep that in our mind, keep that in order. Now, Paul's teaching this to the church, and he says that he's been given specific authority by God to speak to the church, both Jews and Gentiles. Even though he was a Pharisee, he was appointed by God as an apostle, especially to speak to the non-Jewish people the Gentiles. So he feels called to share the gospel, whether it be Jew, of which he is the foremost, or whether it be a Gentile. So to date, he has been writing and addressing Jews separate from the Gentiles. But as he writes to this Roman church, now he was speaking to them together as one body. So the context of this chapter 15 and this idea about unity is, is how some of us can become stumbling blocks. To other believers, other Christians, other members of the body. And Paul is making the, the contention that the strong in their faith, need to endure the weaker understandings with sacrificial loving restraint on the part of the stronger ones. One way to explain that would be to say, stop living according to what pleases you and your understanding and consider other people's position. That's a pretty good summation of what the fruit of the Spirit are and how we can attain and maintain unity among us. Goes back to that sacrificial idea. Now, the weight loss industry is a multi-billion dollar industry in this country, maybe across the world. And when you look at all the gimmicks and gadgets and formulas and all that stuff, you can, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. But the reality is that, that losing weight comes down to two simple things. Diet and exercise. Period. You don't need any other thing except to be in control of your diet and your exercise. Those two things work by themselves, nothing else needed. So using that analogy, Paul is saying this, unity comes down to two things, just two things. I mean, there's all kinds of gimmicks and gadgets and ideas and concepts about, about unity and what, what comes, how you, how you attain unity, but it really comes down to two things. Number one, Stop pleasing only yourself. And number two, consider other people's positions. Because those two things work in terms of acquiring or, and, and main, attaining and maintaining unity. Let's get into the verses. That's kind of like all of that sort of background information. Let's get into Romans 15, 1 and 2. We who are strong 
ought to put up with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. So there's that principle. I mean, in ver already verses 1 and 2, what we just talked about, Paul's laying that out right away. Those who are weak, we who are strong. So what does Paul do? Paul, Paul includes himself as those who have a stronger faith. Now here's the thing. When we think about strong, when we use the word strong in our language, that's not really what Paul is, the, the, um, um, the definition that we usually attach to that word is not exactly what Paul is talking about here. It's usually when we think of something as strong, we think of something that's superior, something that's better, something that's, that's more than. Paul is just speaking about this in a way that we have grown, the strong have grown in conviction beyond where the weak have their convictions. It's more of a matter of maturity. It's more of a matter of a broader experience and outlook. It's not a matter of being better or superior and somehow. So the weak might be like, children or newborn Christians. Lots of times when people come into the faith as a newborn Christian, they, they have a very low understanding. They, they, they are, they're ignorant of a lot of the things of the faith and they have to grow and learn and mature in that faith. They're very vulnerable at that point. That's why adults are to be in charge of children. Which, which again, you know, using our culture today, is the whole issue, in my opinion, about this transgender health care stuff. The child is not capable of deciding whether they think they're male or female. So the adults have to step in. <laughs> because they're adults. So, so the the weaker, the younger, are more influent, are more vulnerable, are more influential, or have, are more susceptible to influence. And lots of times, new Christians are, are, Peggy and I remember this, they're like sponges. I mean, when you become a new Christian, you, you are, you, you're devouring every, every new piece of information, every teaching, everything, it's available, we, you just can't get enough of it. And sometimes, we, you know, you're soaking in all of this stuff, you're, you're vulnerable again, and you soak up the wrong understanding or the wrong interpretation. Because why? Because your discernment, your, the experience of discernment hasn't grown yet. And so you are susceptible to being taught things or being influenced by things that are not actually true. And so Paul is saying, who, who is the one to help that? It's the strong Christians. The more mature Christians need to help, need to build up, need to um, protect those who are weak so that they might attain and, and, and mature in a good understanding, a right understanding. And so here's how he comes around with this. Remember, he was talking about things like worshiping on Sunday and eating certain foods and, and people's convictions about those things. He's saying the way for stronger Christians to help weaker Christians so that they don't damage the weaker Christians and their limited conviction is by flaunting their freedom in front of the weaker Christians. So, someone might be convinced that, hey, it doesn't matter if I eat this meat or not. But the younger Christian believes that that's an apostasy. So, why, why mess them up by boldly eating that meat in front of them? That doesn't help them. It's, on, it's, the, 
It's on the burden of the weaker person to help the younger people till they can grow and gain a, a more mature, a better understanding. Why? Because the weak are unable to bear that. They just haven't grown enough yet. They're not, they're not big enough. They don't weigh enough. They're not tall enough. They're not, you know, all those things about growing up. You know, they're not old enough yet. And so don't, don't make life, don't make life hard for that. They can't, they're unable to. So the burden again is on the strong. Now, that doesn't mean that the strong must share the beliefs of the weaker. I mean, they don't have to give up the fact that, hey, it's okay for me to eat this meat. They don't have to agree with the weaker person that, no, that's not okay. That's not what they're saying. They're just saying, don't practice, don't flaunt your freedom in front of them, making it more difficult for them to live their Christian lives, to, to grow up in their Christian life. And why do we do that? We do that so that we can maintain unity in the church. Because if there's some who are uh, believe that this is completely wrong and they see other people who are blatantly doing it, what they think is wrong, then that creates disunity and disparity in the church. Who's the best example of this? Christ, Christ right? Christ would be. What did Christ do? He gave up his life in glory. What would that be called? A sacrifice. You know, stronger, has the stronger faith. He gave up his life in glory to become what? Human, to become weak, to become like us, like us for what? For our sake. He gave up pleasing himself I mean, living in glory has to be pretty good stuff. He gave that up in order to help us. He considered our position. So, he's our example. We're going to be coming back to that. Let's go to verse 3, 15 verse 3. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. So, here now we get into this Christology thing. Remember we told you, Paul's, Paul's theology is the best in the world. Uh, literally, to, even to this day. Paul's theology, 2,000 years ago, is the best theology we have in the whole world. So what's our motivation? Let's just think for a second. What's the motivation for us to work for unity, to strive for unity among us? Well, we have Scripture. We have the witness of Jesus Christ. We have the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And we have our prayer life. In our human nature, it's never natural for, strong, for the strong to always indulge the weak. In fact, we built a whole system of evolution on the opposite, right? What's the contention of evolution? The strong survive, and the weak die off. That's the way of the world, all right? So if the strong are going to indulge the weak, what is, what's that going to take? That's, that's going to take something that's supernatural among us, because we all have the tendency to do that ourselves. So we need to be inspired. We need to be motivated. We need to be convicted by the Holy Spirit that that's what we need to do. So the strong are under even more mandate to be connected in their maturity, to be connected and to follow the, the Holy Spirit, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So once again, the strongest man that ever lived on earth was Jesus Christ. Again, freely giving up his, his glory in order to work for us and with us, helping us to achieve an eternal salvation, which we were unable 
to accomplish ourselves. So for our sake, he did not please himself and stay in glory. He considered the position of the people of the world and he came to us. So you'll notice that in this verse, chapter, verse 3, Paul quotes the Old Testament. He says, The insults of those who insult you have fallen upon me. He's using that as if Christ is speaking that to us. So here's an interesting thing to use relative to that. Let's think about the Psalms for a second. What, and you know, it's, it's a sort of rhetorical, but it's not. So, in your mind, what are some of the most famous, most quoted, most, most, uh, um, the, the Psalms that maybe are, are most meaningful or endearing in our lives? The 23rd Psalm. 23rd Psalm. Obviously, that'd be one. Take a joyful noise. Okay, Psalm 103 and Psalm 100. You know, we are sheep of this pastor. Um, yeah, that's another one. Um, can you think of some more? 119. Yeah, when talking about God's law, talking about God's word. Thy, thy word is a lamp unto my feet yeah, and a light unto my path. Sure. Um, I look to the hills from whence come my help. My help comes from the Lord, Psalm 46. I mean, so there's a number of psalms that we have grown up with that there are really, um, that get quoted frequently that we use to help us. Okay, let's put aside that and let's ask the next question. What is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament? And it's probably a psalm you can't quote anything from. It's Psalm 69. It's this quote right here. This psalm, Psalm 69, gets quoted more often in the New Testament than any other psalm. What is it a psalm about? It's a psalm about Christ's suffering. So let's look at this quote where this quote comes from out of that psalm. I'm going to begin in verse 6 with Psalm 69. Do not let those who hope in you be put to shame because of me, O Lord God of hosts. So you see where this is coming from now. Right? The weak and the strong. Hey, don't, don't let those be put to shame because of me. Don't let me be a problem. Do not let those who seek you be dishonored because of me, O God of Israel. It is for your sake that I, am, I have borne reproach that shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my kindred, an alien to my mother's children. It is zeal for your house that has consumed me and the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Right? So here's Jesus speaking, you know, it's the prophet, actually, the psalmist, speaking, and we know that this fits the life of Christ. When I humbled my soul with fasting, they insulted me for doing so. And when I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the subject of gossip for those who sit in the gate and the drunkards make songs about me. What are we talking about? We're talking about how Christ left glory, came down here to bear our, to bear with us in our weakness. This is what he endured. Let's pick up again with verse 19. You know the insults I receive and my shame and dishonor, my foes are all known to you. Insults have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. 
All right, so we're using this, Paul is using this to help encourage and help people realize that, hey, as the strong are supporting, I'm going to use that word, supporting the weak, this is this is, might be the outcome. You, you, might, you might need to expect this. And it's okay. The concept of being a servant is the focus here. Strong serve the weak. What did Jesus say? The greatest among you is the one who serves. Oh, okay. So this is all fitting together. Taking the force of all those who are railing against you or insulting you. you know, <clears throat> chapter 48 through 58 in the book of Isaiah is all about the Messiah being the suffering servant. By whose stripes insults, abuse, etc. We, those who are weak, are healed. This is the metaphor, this is the analogy Paul is making. So, it's a matter of standing in the gap of those who are weak. Just as Christ stood in our gap. All right. <clears throat> Why did Christ do that? Well, let's quote him from, and I call this the great priestly prayer, or I've said it before, for me, this is the real Lord's prayer. This is the prayer of our Lord in the upper room before he died. The entire chapter of John 17 is a prayer that Jesus prays. And, and that's why I, I like to follow the Orthodox tradition of naming what we Protestants call the Lord's Prayer, actually the Our Father Prayer. All right, so after Jesus had spoken these things, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. So when we live like this, right, ultimately we will be glorified. The strong will be glorified for the way they live, and that glory will also be part of God's glory. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. What was that? Bearing with the weak. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. What is he talking about? Glory. When they were living in glory. Hey, I have made your name known to those that you have given me from the world. So what is the issue about this? Bringing God glory. Unity is so that we can, the the. the strong bearing with the weak for the purpose of unity, all right, is so that God would be glorified. Jesus continued in that prayer, that they may be one as we are one, Father, I in them and you in me, that they may be completely one, so that the world will know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So that's our motivation here for attaining unity by the weak, by the strong, bearing with the weak. All right, so verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. 
<clears throat> it's really easy just to kind of fly through that verse and kind of overlook it, but it's a mistake to do that because this verse is an incredibly insightful verse. And what does it tell us? What does it make clear to us? He talks about the things that were written in the former days. This is Paul speaking now. What is he referring to there? The things that were written in the former days. He's talking about the Old Testament scriptures. The only scriptures that exist when Paul is writing this letter are the Old Testament scriptures. That's all there is. It's easy for us to lose track of that. Every quote that Paul makes from God is from the Old Testament. Because there is no New Testament. We don't lose track of that. That's a really important point. Why did God inspire the Old Testament to be written? For our instruction. Those words were to bring hope to the people, and that hope was ultimately culminated in the New Testament with the life of Christ. But the whole Bible is about our hope. So that what? When we have hope, that produces endurance and perseverance in our lives. We become steadfast when we can live in hope. We, we can be encouraged and encouraging when we have hope. So for our learning, for our hope, God provided the scriptures of the Old Testament. Now, that's a really important point because there are too many facets of the Protestant Christian Church that downplay the Old Testament. There's just no other way to say it. I don't like the God of the Old Testament. That's a mean, vengeful God. I like the God of the New Testament. But, time out. That's pretty skewed thinking. All right? We ignore or dismiss the Old Testament to our peril. It was the precursor to what we understand now in the life of Christ. Without the Old Testament, the life of Christ truthfully becomes meaningless because there's no context for us to understand what Christ did. The only way we know what Christ did for us is because of the Old Testament. So, in our lives, life becomes difficult. We go through hard times. We, we go through problems. How do we do that? With hope. Where does our hope come from? We need that hope. So, you know, Paul says God gave the scripture so that we would be able to endure, persevere with hope. That we can be encouraged by the truth of God's word. Without hope, we simply die. So how does the Old Testament do that? Well, one of the ways is through the prophecies. Study the prophets. That's why there's continual reference back to the prophets. So you say, well, what's the big deal about the prophets or about prophecy? The big deal is all the prophecies got fulfilled. Well, wait a minute. Whenever someone says something and it comes true, even if you don't like it, you have to pay attention, right? When I was a little boy, that was when Muhammad Ali was coming into his own. I was in middle school when Muhammad Ali was, was just becoming known and entering into his 
world famous status. I can remember vividly the people who just detested Muhammad Ali. I mean, that arrogant, no good, loud mouth, you know, flirt like a butterfly, sting like a bee. And I mean, they, here's the thing though, that happened with Muhammad Ali. Everything he said he was gonna do, he did. He accomplished everything, every prophecy he made came true. Now, whether you like him or not, you got to pay attention to that. And that's exactly what the situation is with the prophets, the Old Testament prophecies. Hundreds of prophecies all came true. Well, wait a minute. You need to pay attention to that. That's some good stuff right there. It's hard to refute that. In fact, you can't refute that if everything that's said comes true. No one even comes close to that today. So what's God's word? God's word inspires us, educates us about God's power. Who made all that come true? God did through the prophets. So, you know, that's where we gain our hope. That's where we gain our strength. So the reward for our diligence in studying the prophets is we, we grow in hope. We grow in faith. And what is that all about? How is that important? Why is that an issue? Hope is all about the future, right? Hope for tomorrow, right? We can have a positive approach because we have hope for what is going to happen. That's how we can be encouraged to persevere by the scriptures. Scriptures tell us that we, you know, what did David say? Hey, the God that helped me defeat the uh, bear and kill the lion is the same God that's with me now when I fight Goliath. Oh, okay. That's what we're talking about. That's that hope. That's that faith. That's, that, that's, that's our belief. That hope is what comforts us and allows us to hang on, to keep strong, to persevere. Now, even though it's about the future, it changes the present, right? If, if David did not have that past knowledge about the bear and the lion, he easily could have run away from Goliath. But he was holding on to that, right? So we react and respond to the present depending upon what our hope for the future is. You see how that works? That's why this is really important. So our endurance, our perseverance, our steadfastness is related to scripture and the promises, fulfilled promises in scripture. Let's go to verses five and six. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's the heart of this again. What does unity do? Unity demonstrates to the world that all of us worship the same God and we gain our strength and encouragement and we receive our eternal life from the same God. All of us with one voice glorifying God. So, we're working with the children on Wednesday evenings with a curriculum from Answers in Genesis that is trying to lead them through the truths of the scriptures, the total scripture story. So where they began, and we're kind of reviewing with them a little bit again in this, this next session that we're starting tonight, 
when we're dealing with them, the attributes, the characteristic of God. Who is God? What is God like? All right. So one of the features about God is that God is eternal. What does eternal mean? It means when something's eternal, it means there's no beginning and there's no end. Well, that's pretty hard for us to understand, right? I mean, everything we know about in this world has a beginning and has an end. So something that has no beginning and has no end, obviously that's something more than what's in this world. Great concept for kids. What's another way that we might help kids to understand that? You can't measure it. All the things in this world can somehow be measured. Now, this, God can't be measured. He's bigger than what can be measured. So, we need to, in practice, endurance, facing the present with a faith that comes from that source. Something that's not measurable. Something that has no beginning and has no end putting our faith, our hope in that is what then gives us the ability to persevere and endure. And when we all turn to God with our faith, that brings us into a unity. We need to be in one accord. Writing to the Philippians, Paul says it this way, you need to be like minded with Christ. Well, when we're part of Christ's body, we yield to the mind, to the head of the body. That's Christ. That's where our unity is produced. The reality is that there really is no other perfect example of unity anywhere in the world there shouldn't, and except in the body of Christ. And the problem is, what? We, we have failed to demonstrate that. That's the failure of the church in the world. We've been unable to demonstrate our unity, so the world really doesn't know about true unity. They were supposed to learn about unity through us. We've never been able to really accomplish that. So, back to this concept. The strong serving the weak, just like Jesus served us. Sacrificing, being willing to step back from what pleases me, what, what my conscience tells me is okay, so that I might consider the position of those who are weaker than me, thus attaining and maintaining unity. So one of the features about the attributes of God that Dr. Gil Tackett teaches us about is the idea that everything in the world stems from who God is and what God is like. So for an example, let's look at God being God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now how many fingers do I have up there? Three fingers. But in reality, what are they? One. Well, what's that called? Trinity, Trinity. Unity, the Trinity, the unity of the Trinity. Perfect unity of the Trinity. Right? You and me and I and them. See the prayer that he's making? So that they may be completely one and the world would know that you have sent me and that you love them the way you love me. When we are trying to learn about the world, what 
when we're trying to understand God's word and purpose, it's very helpful to first look at who God is. Because what we're trying to learn will line up with who God is. God will never be contradicted. So when we are having a difficult time understanding something, figure out what part of God's nature is related to this. Study that, that nature of God and then apply it to this issue. Because everything we know about stems from who God is. Because everything in the world aligns with who God is. The Holy Spirit's job is to teach us the words of Christ. And Christ's job was to teach us who God is. See, the Trinity is constantly glorifying each other in perfect unity. For us to be able to glorify God, we must be able to attain some sort of unity. Look how far away the church has been from that. How many denominations are there in the world? We can't even unify over whether you can baptize by sprinkling or you have to be under the water. I mean, really? So how does God glorify it in that? He's not. And, and you see what happens when God is not glorified? Look where we are in this country. We have lost the sacred in this country. Nothing is sacred. Certainly not God. And when we refuse to make God sacred, when we refuse to live like as if this is God and this is us, when we refuse to do that, things fall apart because that's the order. And when we don't want to live by that order, it does not go well. And that is a one sentence summary of what's happening to us right now in this nation. Nowhere does Paul extol, in all of his letters, nowhere does Paul extol unity like he does right here in this chapter 15. Heavenly Father, convict us today. So that we might be more unified and bring you glory. In Christ's name, amen.